I would like to welcome you to the panel that is going to uh, start our journey in terms of meeting decarbonization goals and objectives. And uh, the first one is the 2030 uh, horizon, uh, meet, uh, achieving EXI and CII compliance. Uh, so we have a great panel to, uh, here uh, that is going to discuss how to achieve compliance for the existing fleet and how shipping companies in different sectors can navigate towards that common objective. Uh, I, Andy McCarran from Lloyd's Register is going to moderate the panel. I would like to welcome Lars, Scott, Salvatore, Dimitris, and Paolo, and I will turn it over to Andy. And again, thank you to all of you for being with us today. So thank you very much indeed, Nicholas, uh, for the warm welcome. Uh, so firstly, as Nicholas says, my name is Andy McCarran, and I'm the business director for the Maritime Performance Services Unit within Lloyd's Register. And I'd like to personally thank Nicholas and the entire Capital Link team for the opportunity to, to host this exciting panel today. So to set the context for our discussion, at MEPC 76 in June this year, the International Maritime Organization is expected to adopt amendment to MARPOL Annex 6, introducing an energy efficiency design index for existing ships, EEXI, and an operational carbon intensity reduction requirement. The objective of this is to have technically efficient new and existing ships operating efficiently to achieve the IMO's interim level of ambition for 2030. Applicable to vessels above 400 gross tonnes, the EEXI generally requires pre-EEDI and EEDI certified ships to catch up with their new construction contemporaries, complying with the latest applicable phase of EEDI. However, compliance with EEXI is just the ticket to the game. For some ships, that ticket could be needed as early as the 1st of November 2022. The game itself kicks off on the 1st of January 2023, and the challenge is operational carbon intensity reduction for EEDI, EEXI compliance ships of 5,000 gross tonnes and above. Compliance will be determined and verified based on fuel consumption reported to the IMO Data Collection System, or IMO DCS. We're currently seeing the operational carbon intensity re reduction requirements getting much less airtime than EEXI, but it is the regulation that is designed to drive that carbon intensity reductions between 2023 and 2030. It will require ships to achieve annual carbon intensity reduction targets and be rated on a scale of A to E based on how they perform relative to those targets. The midpoint of rating or band C will represent the minimum required carbon intensity reduction in any year. It is expected that ships will have their targets set and performance measured using a capacity based metric. In most cases, the annual efficiency ratio or AER. Whilst the annual targets remain to be determined, we do know where the fleet needs to end up in 2030 and the two approaches to determining reduction rates, with the most stringent requiring a 22% improvement in AER for all ship types between 2023 and 2030, relative to a newly calculated 2019 baseline. The intent of the operational carbon intensity reduction requirement is to drive continuous improvement and adaption beyond the improvements the industry has been delivering organically. Owners and operators are expected to be pushed to pursue greater efficiency by technical, operational or organisational means. Although the AER focuses mines on fuel consumption more than anything else, if fuel strategies are exhausted, and the addition of new equipment is unlikely to deliver the expected return on investment, owners could be forced to make earlier decisions on end of asset life. Criticism over the reliance on AER is evident, including regarding inappropriate penalizing of high payload trades and triangulated trades, which minimize ballast legs. The impact of this requirement depends on how consistently and robustly it is implemented. There is a perception that in the first few years, the impact of underperformance will be more administrative than material. A review by 2026 of this measure is expected to see a strengthening of enforcement applied to persistently underperforming ships. The requirements may lead to frictions between owners and charterers. It is after all a new constraint on commercial operations. 
How the market may use the ratings remains to be seen, but they do represent a new source of environmental performance information, which is unlikely to be ignored. In summary, complying with the EXI is essential for ships to continue to trade, and there are many reasons to think that consistently maintaining a carbon intensity rating of C or above could be a vital commercial and regulatory risk management strategy. So today I am joined by five senior leaders from the main shipping sectors to get a view on how they are assessing the implications of EEXI and operational carbon intensity reduction and what they may be doing about it. So starting with Lars, please can you introduce yourself, your company and share your initial reflections on EEXI, uh, operational carbon intensity reductions and what it means for your sector. Uh, so Lars, please to you first. Yes, okay, uh, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, or morning, or evening, wherever you're dining in from. Uh, my name is uh, Lars Peterson, uh, and I joined the Sea Tankers Group of companies in 2018. I'm the MD uh, of Flex LNG Fleet Management, as well as CTO for Frontline, with the responsibility of technical management of all our own vessels and all our new building uh, projects and activities under the Sea Tankers group of companies, which are part from Flex and Frontline. And Sea Tankers also counts uh, Golden Ocean, uh, SFL, uh, and Amans Gas. Prior to joining uh, Sea Tankers, uh, I was managing director for PW uh, Fleet Management and previously head of uh, Fleet in Hook, but also had various positions uh, within the AP Muller Mersk group including uh, a sailing chief engineer. So the way we look at it uh, is that global trade and movement of goods of any form of energy are transported on a global fleet of approximately 70,000 vessels in different form and shapes, which again translate to about 80% of all cargo volume being transported at sea. We therefore welcome the ambition and move towards a greener and cleaner approach to also include shipping with the goal of lowering our, our environmental footprint. A transition towards less uh, impact to emissions, although not entirely new to shipping, as this has been going on for decades and mainly been driven by fuel efficiency linked to fluctuating bunker prices and consumption and thereby impacting, impacting operational uh, expenses. Now we escalate this uh, and ambitious, ambitious uh, targets are being driven through consumers, through customers, through regulations, through legislations, through owners, through charters, through politics and much more. All in all, a great common push. We then, as an industry and owners, have to find a sensible and balanced approach uh, that also makes business sense, uh, where one size does not fit all, and all questions or answers uh, to different technical solutions or operational platforms are not all given or are not fully developed yet, and which again makes it not so simple uh, just to make a shift change uh, as several loose ends uh, must tie together first. In Frontline, we have established uh, our baselines of uh, EEXI, EEOI, and AER, uh, with most of the fleet uh, already meeting the EEXI targets, as well as the IMO 2030 target for AER, as we are benefiting from a relatively young and efficient fleet where of older or less efficient fleets will be challenged and required to lower speeds or make different ESDs, meaning energy saving devices uh, modifications, or do some uh, power limitations, which may very well lead to that more vessels will be required on the water to transport same cargo as each voyage will take a longer time so this can also turn into a, a really positive thing for uh, business development in, uh, in shipping and linked to supply and demand. Anyway, the journey has started well. I think we are all in the same boat uh, and we believe uh, that harmonizing 
regulations globally without exceptions is in our view, a right step uh, in the future direction. Thank, thanks, thank Lars, some fantastic insight there. So thank you very much indeed for that. And Paolo, let's go to you uh, and, and Gazlog's view and on, on the world. Sure, thank you, Andy. And, and, and thanks for Lars uh, for the great introduction. Um, and my name is Paolo Enoiti and I joined Gaslog about two years ago. And I'm working as a CEO of this group who owns and operates approximately 36 uh, large LNG carriers. And we operate under mostly under time charter parties with oil majors and, and traders. And uh, before this, I, I come from the most of uh, my time from the oil and chemical world, where I was the managing director for stall tankers in uh, Rotterdam. Um, it, it's quite interesting what Lars uh, just mentioned, because when I look at the LNG world, what you see is there has been, you know, an extremely fast transformations uh, over the past years that has led to a very defined tiered approach with the guards of the emissions. Um, and the, the driving force of, of this great differentiation within the assets has not been just the propulsion system, but has been the containment system. Because the LNG carrier world relies in its essence, the fact that you're burning your cargo. So you, you have to deal with an you know, unwanted yet, uh, you know, uh, real emission um, of, uh, of your cargo, and therefore you use it in your propulsion system. So STEAM, TFDs, and XDF have been the technical journey. And when you, when you look through these lenses the, uh, of the EXI especially, as you mentioned, the ticket to operate, you know, the license to operate, what you see is that um, the, the application of the EXI is going to drive to start what will be an important segmentation of the market. Now, the real deal, as you mentioned, uh, or the, uh, you, you call it the, uh, you know, the, the game will start with the CII. We call it, you know, the trade mill, you know, when you start jogging and, and becoming fitter is indeed the CII. But uh, that, that, this fact does not take away that the regulations are very much needed because I think we all need to ship in and it's good that we start chipping in as as a whole, as an industry, not, not just as you know, sector by sector. But uh, I think through the discussion today, it will be interesting to see how these, uh, these regulations are actually not going to affect trades and shipping sectors in the same way. Great observations, Paolo, and the LNG market is, is definitely facing some challenges with uh, steam turbines, for example. So thank you for sharing that insight. Um, Scott, uh, to, to you next, if we may. Thank you, Andy, and uh, welcome to all from, from me. Um, yeah, Scott Bergeron. I'm a director for uh, business development and strategy at Oldendorf Carriers. Oldendorf Carriers is a, a German bulk carrier owner and operator. We're operating some 700 ships in any given day, of which we own well over 100 of those ships. Um, from the dry bulk perspective, uh, from a global carbon footprint accounting perspective, uh, we probably have the largest ton mileage of all the three major shipping sectors and maybe one of the lower uh, carbon emissions amongst tankers, bulk carriers and container ships. Uh, but certainly that's not enough um, and, and work has to be done here. Uh, we're talking about e e sorry, EEXI and the carbon intensity indicators. And um, in many respects, I think EEXI while not yet um, finalized by the IMO, we expect that to happen in June, it's already yesterday's news. And I think um, with the carbon intensity indicators, uh, we're really in the, the fog of war, the war on carbon, if you will, because there's a lot of uh, inconsistency of the applications. The, there's so many formulas out there with different names, AER you've mentioned, EEOI, EEPI, and the list goes on and on. And everyone has a different take on how these should be applied and what baselines we start with. Um, and it's creating a lot of confusion. But I think, uh, you know, one comment I wanna make today is, is this is the first time where I see uh, an acceptance from the charters to recognize that we're in this together. You know, in the past, if we look at ballast water, if we look at IMO 2020 and sulfur um, and other regulations along uh, the, the last couple of decades, 
you know, the questions from the charter might have been, how are you going to deal with this? You know, that was the question of the ship owner. But today, the conversations we're having with our travelers are, how are we going to deal with this? And I think that is really a, a big step in recognition that, um, you know, to use the pandemic phrase, we're in this together, you know, in the, the war on ca carbon, if you will, we are truly in this together. I um, mean, it is for society's good. But at the same time, this is a global energy issue. This is not a shipping issue. Um, so maybe it's a little bit uh, unfair to just look at the shipping sector. We really have to embrace and understand what all of the energy sectors um, and all the energy consumers are, are doing so we can uh, find the best approach. Thanks, Scott. Some great observations there again. I think we use the word collaboration a lot in maritime, and it usually means that somebody's going to suffer. So I, 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 do, I do like the way that you're actually sort of giving that broader perspective on that this is a genuine collaboration, I think, to answer the question around CIIs, because it's going to affect every stakeholder. And the other thing is the concept of the well-to-wake analysis that, that needs to be looked at right the way across the board of the supply chain. So some great observations there, and thank you. Um, Salvatore, to, to, to you next. Hi. Hi to everybody. My name is Salvatore D'Amico. I work for the D'Amico Group, which is a shipping company owned by my family since 1956. We operate a total of 70 vessels, of which we, uh, sorry, we manage about 70 vessels. We own 50 and we operate in total about 100 vessels, both on the tanker and on the, on, and on the dry bulk side. We start on the, uh, let's say, on the handy side, on both, on both uh, business lines and uh, up to mini capes for the dry bulk, while on, uh, on the tanker side, we have up to the LR1 size. So uh, my name, as said, is Salvatore D'Amico. I am basically the fleet director for the D'Amico Group. And uh, I am also the CEO of Ishima, which is our third party ship management company. Basically, uh, we see the current regulation as the baseline uh, to what we had to comply with many, many, many years back. So I share what the others were saying when they were talking about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the real new room, uh, the new elephant in the room is the fact that the for, the, for the first time, charterer could be involved in uh, uh, driving down vessel emission uh, by ensuring that vessel operate uh, in a certain way, in particular, if the EOI is used in place of the AER index. Uh, when, it, when we are talking about EXCI, this is a completely different topic. I can talk for, my, for our own fleet. We have basically developed our vessel back since the design stage, even before the energy efficiency design index was put in force. So, well, I'm talking here about the pre-EDI vessel, Already, they were, they, we, we gave a lot of attention to environment. And as a matter of fact, today, when we see um, at our power curves and when we see about what had to be done in order to reduce the consumption and to be in compliance, uh, to be possibly in compliance with the EDI for the phase zero vessel or the phase one vessel of the, um, of the new regulation, we are pretty much already in line without doing anything. And this is because when those vessels were developed, when those vessels were designed, we had already uh, very, very big attention for environment. Just to underline that D'Amico has established a fleet performance department back uh, more than 12 years ago. And uh, at the time for a company like D'Amico, this was an enormous step ahead. But, uh, and if you compare us with our tiers, there are still many tiers around who doesn't have this kind of department. This is to say that, environment and attention to emission has always been our top, top priority. And it's not a matter only of designing the best performing vessel, but actually ensuring that the vessel continues to perform throughout its entire lifespan at the best performing, um, at the best performance, which means at the end of the day, less emission. Salvatore, thank you. So leading the way in terms of thought leadership pre-EDI on, on efficiency of ships, so that, that, that's good to see. And last but by no means least, uh, Dimitris, uh, over, over to you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Hello to everybody. <clears throat> I'm Dimitris Vastarujas, Deputy Chief Operating Officer and Technical Director in Danao. Working with the company for 26 years, being involved with ships in operation, 
and also uh, research and development of the company. I'm very glad actually to be here today to share views and listen ideas because I think it is a very hot area, hot issue uh, with uh, debatable approaches. Uh, there are different approaches. So uh, I think that at the end, we have to find the most efficient way to comply with new regulation. And at the end, we need to contribute to the environment to give something back and uh, uh, to have the proper decarbonization on time. In the container sector, I think that the dominant factor is the carbon intensity because that refers to the actual daily ships operation, the actual emissions. The EXI is a tool for us. It is the way to set an upper limit in order to enable the container shipping companies uh, to allow me to say play with the adjustment of the carbon intensity. The EXI is something that will not bother the container shipping uh, companies because already the speeds that we have uh, observed the last years are within the margins that the new EXI uh, dictates. So uh, we do not see uh, any serious effect on the uh, market, on the container market. However, how much the companies are going to invest in being involved uh, with uh, optimizations, et cetera, to improve the uh, carbon intensity depends on some factors that are not uh, directly under our control. For example, what will be done with the tax, the CO2 tax, and who will pay for this? It will be a levy, it will be an emission trading scheme. Nobody knows at the moment. There are of course approaches, uh, different interests, but still we don't know. And the, how the financial institutions at the end will take into consideration the rating of the various benchmarkings. And what will be at the end, the, the benchmark is for the cargo intensity at the end. So all these are uh, so far non-replied questions that will play serious role in how the companies will meet the requirements in new regulations. So at the moment, my conclusion is that the EXI, desirable or not, is welcome to come and uh, uh, we need to comply with it and certainly will not affect the container business. Thank you very much indeed, Demetrius. And I, I think that's a great sort of overview, I'm gonna say, of, of traveling around the sectors of maritime in terms of some of the nuances, but also some of the commonality um, that we're gonna see in terms of the approach. But I think, Demetrius, you, you've, you've touched on some of the uncertainty. So I think you know, the next question sort of leads on to what, what steps are your companies taking to address EEXI? Or if your companies have already taken those steps, what are the industry taking in terms of your specific sectors? And so starting with you, Demetrius, please, is that given that box ships are clearly facing some steep actions to comply. So Demetrius, to you, please. Yeah. First of all, we need uh, to separate uh, two categories vessels older than 10 years and younger vessels. Uh, we have seen that the vessels built uh, 10 years ago, uh, their designs uh, had the speeds, high speeds, uh, 24, 25 knots. That means there is a, a big tolerance uh, with EEXI. And uh, I, I will present you some statistics that we ran uh, and I would like to share with you. The last years in uh, the container sector, we have an average speed of 16 to 17 knots. Uh, imagine that uh, when we apply the EXI, uh, we can have speeds between 21 to 23 knots. So there is plenty of space there. And uh, looking back what really happened the five years and especially the last year where the market was even uh, better and uh, we had better, uh, had bigger utilization of the ships. Uh, we found out that out of 63 vessels, only uh, four vessels had a percentage of 4% where the speed in combination with the power that derived from the EXI and the load re reduction were appeared. 
I mean that that is quite negligible and uh, shows that the EXI is easily to be applied for the container ships by simply lowering the load and applying an EPL. There is plenty of uh, power there, so there is no real concern. At least this is what we have observed the last five years. Now, regarding the possible energy efficiency improvement methods, I think that the, with the container shipping companies, since we had uh, big speeds and high loads, uh, the, the package of optimization methods have, has already been applied. In the Danaus, for example, we established our R&D after the crisis of 2008, and we are working with them since that time. So, and I think most prudent companies have done it. For companies that they have done nothing so far, yes, it might be an effect, but I think uh, it will be, uh, I could say, marginal. So, uh, in conclusion, with EEXI, the solution for, uh, not only for our company, but for the container ships in general, it is to uh, lowering the load. We have too much load available there. There is no bar range. So uh, this. I think we this is the way to go. It is a cheap oh. way to go uh, from a, a very past. Uh, we have seen that uh, most of a uh, company, most of uh, vessels comply with uh, this and uh, we'll have uh, lots between 50 to 60 percent which is more than enough. Super, thank you Demetrius. We lost you for a second there but I think we definitely got the um, the gist of what you were saying so th thank you very much indeed for those insights. So Paolo, um, what, what are you up to in Gazlog as far as the, um, I'm going to say, measures that you're taking to address the EXI? Um, the EXI um, has really a different take uh, on, on LNG carriers because you can actually see that um, the steam vessels are the ones who are going to have material issues there. And the material issues will materialize because, um, one, it will actually eat in the available speed that you use in your shelter party. So, you know, you will, you will actually be barred from reaching the top end of your speed on steam vessels. And there, just to remind everyone, you're really between a bit of a rock and a hard place because you have your natural boil off, which is the natural amount of cargo that comes out of your containment system, which you have to burn or reliquify somehow. And then you have your sort of top speed there. So I think the good news is it's only the steam vessels who have these kind of issues. We own and operate uh, seven of these ships. So we're actually looking at that. Um, on, the, on the other hand, on the energy saving devices, the good news or the bad news is that LNG carriers have always been built to a very high level of specification. So from whatever way you look at it, the yards that we used to build them, the hull lines, the propulsion systems, the quality of materials or technical solutions, you know, they somehow limit the room for you to maneuver to get additional uh, efficiency in there. Um, so in, in general, when you look at the market in, in a parallel to what Dimitris has mentioned, um, the positive stuff is that the LNG carrier world has also same down the average speed. So what you see as the new speed coming out of the EXI redu reduction are actually very much in line with the operating speed that the industry has used. The, the possible, a possible threat is that most of these carriers work on the time charter parties. And therefore you might incur into an interesting legal debate with your charters because you will be arbitrarily changing an important fact of your, of your performance warranty. And just last note on, 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 uh, on this point here, um, it, there's lots of discussions now on the EXIs and the CII, especially for steam vessels with different countries taking different sides. Um, but unfortunately, the steam plant is one of those plants where the, 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 lower, the, uh, the, the lower the load, uh, the much, much lower the efficiency you get out of it. It's not the same curve you have in a two-stroke engine and so on. So there are also some other technical uh, clarifications there. But um, I think that's, that's uh, a view on the EXI uh, impact, uh, Andy. Thank you so much, Paolo. Some, some good, good insights there again. And then, then Scott, as, as far as you're concerned in terms of Oldendorf and bulk carriers, what, what sort of things are you looking at in terms of addressing EXI at this stage? Yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, 
EXI is a little bit of yesterday's news. I mean, it's setting a, a design benchmark, if you will. Um, it's, sorry for my clock there. Um, it's 7.37 bells um, here in the US. Um, so we're, we're really looking at, um, you know, a fixed number, right? It's a number that the classification society is gonna certify just like EEDI. Um, and the older ships are gonna to have to, to do something. What can be done? Um, appurtenances, as I call them, can be installed, Mewis ducts, um, different types of fins and bulbs and propellers, things of that nature that are gonna give you single digit efficiency improvements. But I think for the most part, ships that need to comply with EEXI are gonna install engine power limiters. These are not very expensive uh, governors um, that can be installed and, and they limit the power of the engine. And, and I think when we look back the last 18 months or, or so, there's a huge call to reduce speeds um, as, as the thing we can do. And, and EEXI and engine power limiters, um, I think is the appropriate way to reduce speed. You're really holding back the source of the speed and that's easier to regulate than regulating speed itself. Uh, Paulo makes a, a great point. You know, the, the, the charters are gonna have to work with us on those cases. But I think it was also mentioned by Dimitri that um, for the most part, um, ships are, are somewhat compliant. Um, you know, the older we get in the ship age, yes, they're gonna have to have more power limited. What I see is, you know, in our fleet between zero and maybe mid 30% power reductions for some of our older ships. But when you look at the speed reduction, we're talking about uh, single digit percentage reductions. And then when you look at what your new authorized speed based on the reduced power will be, um, you're still within uh, the speed that we're operating the ships at, that we're advertising the ships at. I see a question in, in the, um, the, the chat here from one of the audience that says, what, am I, what I'm hearing is EEXI does nothing to reduce real emissions. Isn't anyone concerned about this? I think that's a little bit unfair and, and you know, only looking at half of the story. Uh, EEXI, as I mentioned, is that baseline. And I don't think we're gonna expect a, a huge amount of emissions redu reduced by that because it's the design index. It, it's bringing the older ships to a more modern standard, the way ships are being designed on an efficiency basis today. The CII, the carbon intensity indicators is the tool that's gonna to drive the emissions down. Um, but that being said, um, the devil is in the details and uh, one of the very important numbers in, in getting your EEXI number is the so-called VREF. That's basically your starting speed. And that comes from the C trial. And before the EEDI regulations were available, there was no standard for C trials. So there's a lot of interpolation going on based on the older C uh, trials and, and the starting speed, if you will, in this calculation. And that's where I think, Andy, a, a plug to the classification societies. Um, there are some, some submissions to the IMO, but the class society is going to help develop a standardized approach to finding that initial VRAF, that, that starting speed for EEXI. So that's one of the things to watch. That's an area I suppose that could be gamed. Uh, but still, overall, EEXI is, to me, just that benchmark, that baseline from a design standpoint. Yeah, I'd build on that, Scott. I think it's a great observation in answering the question that we've been asked. It, it, you know, as we've referred to, it's the ticket to the game before the continuous improvement starts. So it's it's do you get the chance to play? So it could take out tonnage. I mean, it's as simple as that. If there isn't a return on investment case to get, you know, to buy your way into the game that will become CII. So I think that's the reality around EEXI is about getting that benchmark. But to have that robustly and... Um, let's say, coherently applied across the industry is certain, certainly an area that all the classification societies will, will try and assist the industry. But it leads nicely, I think, Scott, in terms of some of your um, observations there onto the next question, which is that compliance with EEXI could, can require changes to the vessel's design or machinery by retrofitting of energy efficiency technologies, EETs. Um, so, so I'm going to ask the next question and firstly go to to Salvatore, which is, will you be relying on the overridable power limitation options or are energy saving devices going to be needed? Is the time available to comply um, with you making these choices? And, and what solutions do you see dominating and why? So Salvatore, if that's okay, we'll start with you. Um, how yes. is this influencing your decisions? 
So let me start from the last question you posed before talking about what we are doing. Uh, to give a proper answer to this question, I have to say that there are several methods of compliance with the EXI requirement. As a matter of fact, you can choose to go by alternative fuel, obviously excluding the drop-in because today there are no regulation about them. Uh, and here goes back to before to what Scott was saying about the, let's say, well to wake rather than uh, the um, effect uh, of the consumption of the mission, sorry. Then the installation of energy saving devices uh, or, uh, the, or limit of the MCR. It is quite likely that the effect of the XI on the existing ship will primarily be to drive to power reduction rather than fitting energy saving devices. And this is basically for time scale. Um, conceptually, the approach is that to reduce the MCR, it, and it is uh, suggested to do this via the shaft or the engine power uh, limit. Such solution will be predominant and as mentioned for time scale reason with no impact on the safety of the vessel because in any case, this is a non-permanent solution. We have seen several uh, um, options available on the market and in, um, in case of bad weather, the owner can in any moment uh, override it, uh, which will leave the reserve of power in if you encounter, for example, adverse weather condition. However, as an owner, we need to have a medium and long-term vision. And uh, for the time scale, although EPL will be the most popular solution to comply with EEXI, the installation of energy saving devices will improve the efficiency of the vessel, allowing to satisfy either a pathway of reduction prescribed by the CII or possibly market request for a speed increase, which we all hope would happen because this means that the market is definitely recovered. In conclusion, if not immediately, EXI metric, we need to do more to work on vessel efficiency in any case. So when we talk about us, as I said at the beginning, we are mostly already in line with all of our vessels. And those vessels which are not in line, which are the oldest vessel, are not in line by a very, very, very minor uh, modification. I want to highlight that we have some vessels which, uh, which are which have been uh, designed before the entry into force of the energy efficiency design index. And those uh, were already equipped with uh, uh, some uh, energy efficiency device uh, uh, system. So this is to say that our vessel were really pretty much advanced compared to what the market was offering. But that said, on those vessels, because we are talking about a very, very minor modification, most probably we will go by a small reduction of the MCR because from what we have seen, those vessels have been developed with a speed that today is not uh, reached anymore. Uh, we are talking about vessels capable of uh, sailing uh, continuously at 15 knots. It doesn't make any sense in today's market. I think I answered your question. Very much so, Salvatore. And I'm, I'm going to go to Lars next for, for his perspective. And, and Lars, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit as well, because there's a question in as well on the Q&A that sort of talks about with power limitation and speed reduction issues, these bring more benefits from wind propulsion. So maybe as, as you answer on, I'm going to say energy efficiency technologies, maybe we could have a perspective on how does the how do you see the hybrid approach to delivering EEXI as well? Mm. Yes, uh, thank you. So so what I said initially, I think fuel efficiency and, and efficiency is not, is not new to shipping and to any of, of us uh, joining the call today. Uh, uh, so we have been focusing on having fuel efficiency for a long time uh, because it has been driven by environmental impact and uh, as well as directly on your bottom line uh, through uh, bunker and bunker consumption. But of course, the new thing is the future carbon uh, uh, tax or whatever that will come out of it and how it will be penalizing uh, uh, or justifying uh, uh, your uh, consumption depending on how you look at it. But for the way that we have done it uh, in, in uh, our approach is that uh, first of all, we have established uh, best baselines for, for our in, entire fleet like Salvatore uh, said. So have an idea of where are we with the different fleets and, and, and what can uh, easily uh, have a, a smaller modification to, to, uh, to comply and who will have or which vessels will have to do a bigger job. And then you look in the toolbox of what different 
opportunities do you have in the toolbox and what does really have an effect? Because uh, in fuel efficiency, at least it is my experience that uh, it's, it's not enough just to apply one thing, but it's a number of things that in contribution gives a good effect. So uh, if you do uh, a power limitation, yes, you can do that if you have power enough available uh, in, your, in your ship to comply, first of all, with the uh, IMO uh, recommendations of how much power you should have available. But it certainly also, it has to suit uh, the trading, trading pattern of the ship. So you have a product that are still uh, attractive to your charterers. So these are the things that you have to look at, but I agree for most of, of the fleets they have, or ships, they have actually been designed to, to run higher speed. So that you do a power limitation and a do a speed reduction may not have such a big commercial uh, negative effect. So that will be for most, I think, the immediate things people will look at also is probably the less uh, costly. And then there's the other things in the toolbox. You mentioned the wind, for example. Uh, there is other also about uh, 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 minimizing uh, friction uh, through the water, uh, through different uh, devices. Uh, there is about optimizing uh, the uh, water flow to the propeller in different uh, in ways, different ways of doing it. So I think it's uh, it links to uh, uh, for wind, for example. You have different types of of wind ads also, you have the kite solution or you have the water solutions. And for some vessels, maybe water is, uh, is the right design, but for other uh, designs, it's maybe a much more tricky part uh, for cargo operations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but um, it is definitely a tool in the toolbox that we are evaluating. Um, so, uh, and we are also in dialogue with, with some of these suppliers, how it can uh, makes it work, uh, make it work, but we have though not uh, uh, signed up on, on any of those yet. It's more focusing on the efficiency of the water flow to the propeller, I would say, as well as the power limitation. Fantastic, Lars. So to summarize, I mean, it's going to be a combination of all of them, I think, in response to the question. Mm. There's, there will be hybrid solutions of air lubrication, wind propulsion, hydrodynamic designs, etc., that will oh. be in combination with other factors so that exactly so i think to answer the question yes wind propulsion will be one of the options that will be looked at mm -hmm. depending on the sector that that we're in so thank you for that lars so i think building on that that now we move to the um uh, what what measures need to be taken on you know complying with the operational carbon intensity reduction requirements so i think scott i'm going to come to you first about how do you think your sector will be infected i'm going to say in a little bit more detail around you know including i'm going to say the use of ai aers as a cii and um, what do you see as some of those major pain points i think you've touched on the charter owner relationships and what's your company doing to prepare for those conversations or discussions or challenges yeah i made the comment before uh, to me cii carbon intensity indicators this is um, right now we're in the fog of war um, if you think you understand these ratios and these formulas um, either you're much, much smarter than, than me and all of my staff that are working on this, or you actually haven't looked into the real details because there's a lot of different approaches on how to apply these. There, there's a variety of different formulas. Um, there's inconsistency on the, on the benchmarks, inconsistency on the trajectories, and it just uh, becomes more and more complex. Um, you mentioned AER, the annual efficiency ratio. This is um, very likely the formula that's gonna be adopted by the IMO in June. Um, and it's also the one that Poseidon Principles is using. Um, there's criticism around AER. The main reason is because it, um, it uses the ship's dead weight as a proxy for its, its uh, carrying capacity. Whereas some of the other um, CII ratios such as EEOI, Energy Efficiency Operational Index, um, uses the amount of cargo carried by weight and the ballast legs as variables and AER does not. And where I think some of the, um, I would say, innocent misunderstandings are right now is, is nobody really has a firm grasp on, on what these numbers will look like in practice over time. We've computed our um, AER and EEOI and a few of the others 
um, for 2018, 19, and, and last year. Um, and, and you see there, there's variability year on year, year, variability ship on ship, variability voyage on voyage. Um, you know, it's a lot of inconsistencies because it's not very straightforward when you measure the inputs. Um, weather is a factor, slip is a factor, um, cargo density is a factor. So no two voyages are alike. Uh, I would say some of my concerns with, with, with some of these ratios, um, not that we have to pick the right one. I mean, I think picking the right one is really what are you trying to motivate? Um, at the end, it's really about reducing carbon emissions and each formula can, can help achieve that. Um, again, back to one of the criticisms on AER is that um, you know, that you get a benefit from longer boy, vo ballast voyages, perhaps, because you're using less fuel to um, get the mileage in ballast. But I don't think many ship owners are going to sell their ships in ballast with OPEX and fuel costs just to lower the ratio by a few ticks. Um, I mean, those are real expenses. Uh, but similarly, if you look at the EOI, um, the variables there are not in the ship owner's control, particularly in dry bulk. Um, Many ships are out on, on uh, voyage or time charter, and, and the charterer determines how much um, capacity of, of, of cargo is loaded. Um, it could be a low density cargo, a high stowage factor, um, and that voyage is going to be somewhat penalizing. And one bad voyage under an EEOI uh, can destroy a whole year um, of your, your figures. And when there are regulations coming, um, the, EU, the EU is a little more close to EEOI with their MRV data, whereas the IMO is using the DCS data to get AER. Um, you know, if you're gonna be regulated and categorized as a ship A through E in efficiency rating, and some of those variables are beyond your control because the charter had use of your ship, um, you know, that can be a bit scary. So those are some of the initial thoughts. I, I, I think a lot about the CIIs lately um, and could, could talk much more, but maybe it'd be better to answer some questions from the audience. Thanks for that, um, uh, Scott. So I, I'm gonna say yes, let, let's move to one of the questions from the audience because we've probably got time to answer one more question. And I think, um, the, the last question, because one of the questions is exceptionally long, which we'll take offline, but do existing ships need to comply with the minimum power regulation as a safety matter as old ships designed with assumptions of 25%? Is there anybody, because I can, I can take a shot at that and basically say, I think that I'm going to say EDI, EDI certified ships need to comply with the minimum power requirements. Um, however, EXI has no impact on minimum power available. Um, on either EEDI certified or pre-EEDI ships as the full MCR um, remains available should it be required to keep the ship safe at sea. So I hope that that answers that, that question. And I think that was probably the, one of the last ones that we had from, from the audience. So I'd just like to come back for probably one minute from Demetrius in terms of what, what do you see as the, the major pain points, I'm going to say on the operational carbon intensity requirement, and then, then we'll wrap up. So Demetrius, over to you. Uh, the carbon intensity is the, the key challenge for the container business. The reason is that it is directly related with the speed. So number one is to preserve the, the speed constant in the last five years and uh, with same more or less utilization of the ships. Now, how, what can we do to improve? It's a big question and needs too much analysis. Certainly we cannot proceed with big scales uh, retrofits uh, in uh, 10, 15 years old vessels. So, and we have to find solutions that are practical and uh, uh, will bring all these vessels near to the uh, reference lines. Uh, I have to say that uh, a big question here that will affect the market is uh, the biodiesel carbon factor. If the biodiesel carbon factor will be adopted same as a European MRV in the IMO DCS, then instantly with a, with a partial supply of biodiesel, the carbon intensity will drop dramatically. The problem is that in shipping, the, the tonnage providers, the ship owners know how to burn fuel, but they do not have control uh, on finding them. 
Sure. Perfect, perfect, Demetrius. I think that's a great observation. So I'm, I'm going to say, look, a huge thank you to the panel today. I hope everybody's enjoyed this session. And also a huge thank you to Capital Link um, for the thought provoking session that we've had. Um, clearly, the industry has to achieve specific emissions reduction objectives within defined timeframes. And there are a variety of challenges depending on which of the sub segments that we're in. So again, thank you to the panel and thank you to Capital Link for today's event. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. My thanks to you as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.